Good to be with you. Good to be here, Christopher. Yeah. What should we talk about? What's the topic we should talk about? Institute, well, I think it says Maverick, from Maverick to mainstream, right? I think it took Maverick 25 years to make a comeback, so hopefully we'll be quicker than that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Not much going on in the markets these days. No, right? nothing, nothing. <laughs> Anything I, we should mention? Yeah, look, heaps, I think. So I think the purpose of this today is really to talk about institutional adoption. And people might think that the events of the last month or two have affected that. Actually, the pace is quite slow in the institutional environment. You know yourself when you're dealing with banks. So actually, this hasn't really made them break step. So first, maybe I'll, you know, it, point. it might be useful if I sort of gave the backdrop of LMAX Group and yeah. LMAX Digital and why we entered the digital space, because we're not the 20-something, 30-something uh, crypto evangelists or engineers. You look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and yourself. Um, I think, you know, we, we straddle both traditional finance and digital finance. So ostensibly, LMAX Group is an exchange operator. We operate six exchanges globally, three in London, one in New York, one in Tokyo, one in Singapore. Uh, primarily, our asset class is foreign exchange. So we trade 30 billion a day of foreign exchange with all the major banks you can imagine, nine of the world's top 10 and another 30 something. Uh, all the major prop trading houses that you know well, especially in your old role, in Chicago, New York, Amsterdam, uh, and London. And actually, so we've been going you know, well over a decade and about five years ago, it was those prop trading firms that said, knocked on my door and said, hey, David, can you put together some institutional grade infrastructure so that we can mitigate risk and trade with like-minded participants? We hadn't thought very much about crypto at that stage. I was busy doing my day job, which was foreign exchange. Um, it turns out it was relatively trivial, right? It was the same low latency matching engines, the same exchange infrastructure. The hard bit was actually there was no one to store it. So there was no banks around. In my fiat world, I just call up a few banks. I have 163 bank accounts, as like we currently speak, and they store it for me in 16 different nostrils. There was no one there to store the Bitcoin. So the hard bit was working out how to store um, crypto assets. But you know, happy to say we put it together from field to fork, as they say, within six months. LMAX Digital today is the number one institutional cryptocurrency exchange. That's not just hubris, everyone. It's just pure numbers. And that's Spot, right? Spot. Yeah. Uh, there's only you know, one exchange. You may have heard of them. I think they have 60 million customers that trade more Bitcoin than us every day. Mm -hmm. And you know, last year, we averaged $1.5 billion of, of crypto every day. And we just do the easy stuff. We just match buyers and sellers. And I think what you're going to say to me is, well, what's stopping the rest of them? And uh, this is where I'm going to throw to you in your former hat a little bit. There's two, two things that are stopping mass institutional adoption today or stopping the banks entering the space. Um, that's a lack of regulatory determinism. We don't know the rules of the game. And credit intermediation. There is no credit intermediation, certainly in the spot market today. So you know, from that perspective, I'm interested how you say, you know, I'm a novice at this stuff in terms of how new regulation gets created. Um, obviously, you're an expert. We like to think so anyway, if you do it from I, your, from I, I your previous job, chairman. My best jo job to pretend to be one. So. <laughs> so I'm actually interested how you see the regulatory environment, especially in the United States, playing out because you know there's three different bodies there. And I yeah. guess they're all juggling and you know they're all pitching something at the moment. So how do you see that working? So, so uh, as, as you may know, um, when I took over as chairman of the CFTC, uh, there was no U.S. regulated market for crypto derivatives, right. uh, nor for spot, and, and, and nor for securities base. We, um, uh, through the initiative of a big Chicago exchange, they came to us with a self-certification for Bitcoin futures, were able to create the world's first uh, regulated uh, marketplace for derivatives on Bitcoin. And, and, and as I wrote about in my book, which I think many of you will receive a copy or all of you will receive a copy, um, that was a challenging moment. There was a lot of opposition. Uh, and the opposition came from fellow regulators here and abroad. It came from the industry itself. Uh -huh. um, and uh, the opposition was along the lines of, if you allow Bitcoin futures, you will be legitimizing Bitcoin. And as someone who didn't spend a lifetime in Washington, 
uh, the notion that people in Washington have the power to legitimize or unlegitimize or delegitimize a legal product that people may want to trade mm-hmm. struck me as really odd. In fact, it's for the market to legitimize a product, right? Every year, our exchanges roll out hundreds of new products, some of which reach legitimacy because people trade it, many of which don't and disappear after three or four months, yep. right? It's for the market to determine the legitimacy. It's for the market to determine whether there's a need for a Bitcoin future. It's for us as regulators to make sure we put it into a well-regulated, orderly environment, free of fraud and manipulation. And so uh, while that application was pending, we created something called Lab CFTC, and we charged it with responsibility to become expert in Bitcoin as we were getting ready for the self-certification. To the extent that in the summer of 2017, we at the commission, in the commissioner's boardroom, were doing synthetic mining of Bitcoin in order to learn what mining of Bitcoin was all about. Um, that's how far in advance we were, quite frankly, of other regulators here and abroad, and how well prepared we were when Bitcoin futures launched in December of 2017. And the launch of that created a regulated market where the institutions could then come in sure. in a way was regulated. Now, for logical reasons, if you think about it, The CFTC, while it regulates futures and swaps on commodities, does not regulate the underlying spot commodity market. And why say when you think about it? Well, if it did, right, we CFTC regulates gold futures, but it if also regulate the spot market, then it would have to regulate every jewelry shop in America, right? If it regulated, we regulate wheat futures. If we regulate the underlying market, we'd have to regulate every grain elevator in America. And so when Congress gave the CFTC authority over futures on commodities, it didn't give it authority over the spot market. It left the spot market in most of these commodities to state regulators who do indeed regulate jewelry stores through, you know, good business practices, anti-fraud manipulation, grain elevators, et cetera. Now, crypto is another story because there really is not local state markets. There are global markets. Sure. And so I've become a supporter of legislation moving through Congress that would give the CFTC authority over the spot market for commodity-based cryptos. And if that were to become the case, then some of the markets where you serve institutional customers could also come under that same, I think, thoughtful regulation that the CFTC has historically brought to marketplaces. And I think that would be good for institutional participants and would help to expand institutional participation. It could also lead to one other thing that everybody's been hoping for, and that is a uh, an ETF on spot Bitcoin. Why is that? Because the SEC has been comfortable creating uh, allowing an ETF on the CFTC-regulated Bitcoin futures market. Presumably, if the CFTC could also regulate the spot Bitcoin market, then the SEC could get comfortable allowing an ETF on that market. So for those reasons, I'm supportive of it because I think it will bring greater institutional yeah. presence and greater institutional presence makes a more re- a more well-rounded, a more durable, a deeper, a more liquid market, which is ultimately what market regulators are supposed to do, encourage the development of regulated markets, not discourage them. <laughs> I agree, by the way. Let's give, let's bring the, that's absolutely right. I mean, to, to Christopher's point, I mean, there's a lot of chatter about crypto at the moment, uh, but it's still a really small asset class, especially after the last week. <laughs> um, it's now about a trillion dollars of market cap. That is less than half a percent of the world's total assets in custody. And it's back to those, it's back to those two points again, credit intermediation and regulatory determinism, because the institutions do want to trade this. So I have 35 banks trading foreign exchange with me today. Half of them take market data for Elmax Digital, the largest institutional Bitcoin exchange out there, but they can't trade it. The issue there is, and I get confused, I must confess, about US regulation. There, The banks that want to trade it, they're waiting for Fed approval. Then we have uh, the Loomis bill uh, coming up from the CFTC. I'm not quite sure that's going to work. But what I would say to uh, to regulators and policymakers the world over, this asset class is here to stay. Do not confuse Bitcoin that's been around for 14 years and still represents 45% of the market cap and the latest Hujima Flip coin that's been launched in Never Never DeFi land. Within Elmax Group last year, 
Um, Euro dollar is always our biggest currency pair, and it is in foreign exchange. Look at any BIS survey, it's 28% of the global foreign exchange market. BTC USD, Bitcoin dollar, was the eighth biggest currency pair last year on one of the world's biggest fiat exchanges. So they want to trade it, they want to touch it, they want to offer structured products around that to their customers. And what's happening at the moment is we're leaving this exciting nascent asset class to you know, crypto evangelists, crypto natives, who frankly don't understand the plumbing in traditional markets. And we need those tradi that traditional plumbing to work. Right. We need those mechanisms. But what's going to happen in the United States unless we get a move on? By the way, you know, we're regulated by the FCA in the, in the United Kingdom. They also need to get, get a hurry up as well because they're not slowing down in Asia Pacific. Right. So we launched an exchange in SG1 just this year. The first exchange ever we've launched that will be have fiat and crypto on the same exchange, regulated by the MAS. So other regulators are looking at this as a greenfield site. Yeah. So I think you know we're all we're seeing from the same hymn sheet to a certain extent. The banks, the brokers, the proprietary trading firms, they just want a framework. They want to know the rules of the game for a wholesale market. And I think that's the other thing that people get confused. You know, it's let's protect consumers. There is zero protection for consumers today in crypto. Zero much more in equities, much more in leverage products, zero. And let's protect them, but then let's create a wholesale market. And every great market needs um, an efficient institutional foundation. And that's actually what LMAX Group, you know, we're, we're not here, we're not, I'm not selling Bitcoin, I'm not selling euros, I'm not selling gold, right? I'm just selling low latency, institutional grade infrastructure. We're trying to create an ecosystem that hopefully will meet uh, the demands of the regulators, but more importantly, meet the demands of the market and can let this thing grow and create opportunity. Right. You know, you know I, I, I think the regulators in, in many cases um, uh, bear uh, responsibility for some of the policy failures, policy inaction that have led to the regulatory risk, the regulatory uh, lo lack of certainty that exists in many parts of the market. And uh, someone who actually brave the short-term political risk in order to clarify, in order to diminish regulatory risk. Um, what I would say to my fellow regulators, the reward is there if you're willing to brave the short-term political risk. But I think there's a bigger problem. And I think the bigger problem is that, and I think in the industry, we need to do a better job of explaining the value proposition. And as much as we talk about crypto as an investment asset class, yep. it's really bigger than that. Um, what crypto is, and it's a short-term phrase, for basically a revolution in the way that value is established, who owns what and who's transferring what to whom. Historically, since the Bank of Amsterdam took Dutch guilders and put it on default and issued bank notes as receipts for them, our financial system is a, is a series of value recorded on roughly 7,000 balance sheets, institutional balance sheets around the world. Right. Your retirement money is not a stack of dollar bills in Fidelity's vault. Right. It's basically a liability on Fidelity's balance sheet. Your bank account is not a stack of dollars in your local branch bank. OK, it's basically a liability on their balance sheet. When you do a transaction, they transfer that liability to some other banks liability. Seven thousand institutions around the world. And a lot of those institutions go in and out of business all the time. Now, thankfully, in the West, we've got government insurance and other things. Around the world, if your bank goes under, you've lost your value, right? Uh -huh. So what is crypto? Crypto is saying, let's use a different system. Let's record value on that worldwide web of computers, the same place we're recording communications, social networks, and, and everything else that's transformed our life in the last 30 years. The internet is about to do to finance and banking and money itself what it's done to social networking and, and online commerce and travel and entertainment. And that is move it away from trusted intermediaries, some of which are worthy of trust, many of which are not, to an indelible worldwide web that has never crashed in its 40 years of operation. And every new computer that comes online makes it stronger and stronger and stronger. 
And so it's a, it's a revolution the way we think about value. And so when we think about Bitcoin, when we think about Ethereum, when we think about Solana, when we think about Cardano, those are the protocols that are vying to play the role of tying these computers together in that future, right? In the same way that TCP IP tied those computers together for, for messaging, in the same way that Bluetooth, in the same way that 5G tied them together in an internet of things, in an internet of value, we're gonna have these protocols. And so they have value, the value is in the network. The value is in the, and when we trade the tokens, in the same way we trade shares of, of Tesla, we're basically taking a view onto that digital future, right? And the fact that Tesla's stock is down at the same correlated rate that, that Bitcoin's down doesn't change the fact that the future of local transportation is going to be electric. And in the same way that Bitcoin's value doesn't change the fact that the future of value is going to be, on, is going to be internet-based. It's going to be digitized, right? right. That's the and so if I can just finish my thought, the problem is not just the regulators. The problem is that policymakers, whether in London yeah. or the United States, in fact, most of the developed world that have an older population, older than 35 on average, are slower to get this than populations in Africa and Asia that have a population younger than 35 because they grew up in a networked world. And yet our, my contemporaries in Washington grew up in the bank-centric world and are struggling to get this. So until we've got some, I think, some, some real clarity in Congress and elsewhere and policymakers, in fact, until this current septuagenarian leadership of most of the West moves on and allows a younger generation to come into government, they're going to struggle with this concept. But there's no question that the future of value is increasingly going to be internet-based rather than balance sheet-based. A hundred percent. But I think, I think that's the point we need, to, we need to make, which is there's a lot that's happened since the sell-off the last um, week or two, month or two. Um, is this going to zero? It's not going to zero. To your point, it's there. It pervades capital markets today. Blockchain technology is ever-present in capital markets. It will revolutionize settlement, payments, and reconciliation. Those are the things where you always have, like, create bank runs. Right? This is where great names go bust. It's for those three reasons. A lack of controls. Blockchain technology will do it. It's here to stay. And Mike, to your point, um, it's already proven that it's a good way of transferring ownership of assets. That's happening right now. But when you do that, you need to have some currency. Right? And actually, fiat doesn't work. So hello to everyone, um, all my friends. Down, down the street that take uh, T plus two to settle fiat currency. It doesn't work. Just so everyone is clear out there, I settle dollars seven days a week, 24 hours a day, today, Saturday and Sunday. People talk about stable coins. You don't need a stable coin if fiat was digitized and could just move and be used to access the market. They're not required. So this whole myth about making money in stable coins is, is actually just that. We just want to post collateral, or we just want to fund an account to buy um, crypto assets. So, you know, to the world over and to the banks that everyone's going to hold on, hold on a minute, David. We close at at five o'clock on a Friday. The world doesn't close at five o'clock on a Friday. So the biggest thing here about this transfer of ownership you talk about, it has to happen seamlessly, with less friction and constantly. And blockchain technology allows that. The winning currency at the moment happens to be Bitcoin for that. It's not perfect. Don't listen to the evangelists who tell you it's instantaneous, because it isn't. The best we can do is 15 minutes. And guess what? In that 15 minutes, you run hash stat risk, right? You run a lot of credit risk for that 15 minutes. But it doesn't take two days. You know, if I want to buy if I want to buy crypto in Australia today at the weekend, the best main way for me to do that is go to the Bureau of Change, get out my Aussie dollars, and go to JFK. That's just a fact, because it will take longer, right, to 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 use bank wires. So that, but that's the evolution. And back to your point about policymakers and and regulators, that's the opportunity for policymakers, right? What do you really care about? Taxes and jobs, right? Taxes and jobs. Seven day a week capital markets, that's 28% of the, of, the, of the working week, right? Extra. More jobs, more taxes. And it's not that, we, that everyone's blaming the regulators. It's okay that they've taken their time. But let's just get it right and let's let this market grow 
because ultimately we're all incentivized for capital markets to, to grow and benefit from this new technology, as indeed we did through internet stocks. And that's why 105, bank, 105 uh, central banks around the world are currently in advanced exploration of central bank digital currency. It has to be, right. 20 countries have actually launched it. Uh, 19 of the G20 are uh, in advanced exploration of central bank digital currency. Our own Federal Reserve, uh, although a bit behind the curve, um, as they are in too many things these days, um, are, are also uh, looking at central bank digital currency. Um, you, you know, currencies create a network effect. It's, it, in an analog world, it's an, it's an impact or it's a network of influence. But in a digital currency work, world, it could be actually a true network. In fact, what China's looking to do with their ECNY, um, their digital currency, which is now one of the global benchmarks for what central bank digital currency looks like, is great. Just that, a global network. Their digital currency is not just for domestic consumption, it's for export. And many countries around the world will actually want to have PCOB digital currency in a box sure. and slap the name Bolivar on it or another currency name, but it's basically Chinese technology because they want the features of it, features of surveillance, features of censorship. We could see within 10 years, Chinese digital currency technology occupying about a third of the globe. And that's a real challenge for free societies to think about what is our response? What is the response of free society? Do we just come up with China light? Or do we design something from scratch that I would hope would, would enshrine our own values of freedom from censorship, freedom from surveillance for lawful transactions. So really, I think we're at an interesting junction point in the dev development of basically digital money, uh, sovereign and non-sovereign. I think stable coins have a role to play. Certainly, the central banks have a lot to learn from stable coin development. Uh, but the future of money, the future of value, uh, the future of financial services uh, is in networks, just as the future of Everything else that we've learned over the last 30 years is in the, the values in the network. Uh -huh. And I tell people all the time when they come to me and said, I just heard about this great new crypto, um, you know, whatever coin, what do you think? And I say, well, I really don't know anything about it, but I'll tell you what, if there's not value in the underlying protocol, if you don't think that protocol is gonna stand the test of time and have the potential to be one of the 30 or 40 protocols that will eventually power an internet of value around the world, then it's just for speculation purposes. And maybe next month it'll be up and maybe it's worth, but I wouldn't place a long-term bet on it. Wise words. So what do you think, if we look around the market right now, I try to remind people that the S&P also has been sold off. Um, it's not just Bitcoin and crypto only, but it would look like we're entering into a crypto winter. Uh, we might even be a month or two into that crypto winter. Certainly from your old role, you launched right into one. Yep. Uh, Some been say crossed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, no, you didn't. Actually, well, look, hey, look, when, when a healthy market is a market that can both go long and short. Yeah. Until there was the launch of Bitcoin futures, it was only a, it was a long only market. So I would have to pick you up on that, right? Because Christopher keeps flogging a, a, a product of my competitor. It's actually, it's not fit for purpose. It's a five day, it's a five day a week product in a seven day a week market. Oh, I'm not plugging so, their product. I'm, I'm just plugging trying, the- I'm just gonna make it clear yeah. because what we did to show you what we're trying to do from an LMAX group standpoint, is we announced 24-7 crypto futures uh, list on our listed, regulated FCA MTF, uh, centrally cleared via the six group in Europe. Um, basically, most of the banks in the world will trade that on a 24-7 basis from Q3 onwards because uh, my friends in Chicago did not have a divine right to own this asset class, and their current, their current product isn't fit for this market. Because I don't know what you tell any customer. Hey, it's okay. Um, whatever happens at the weekend happens at the weekend. You can close out your position on a Monday. That just doesn't. That just doesn't work. So uh, I just sort of had to jump uh, in there, go, right? You because, go right ahead. Because I, you, they, I didn't see them. The I didn't floor. see them on the on yeah, the yeah, on the wall behind yeah, me. Yeah. But I think the point there was you did not create the crypto winter, and you haven't created this one. But you've lived through it, and you've developed product. Through, uh, through it, and you develop market structure and regulation through it. What do we think about this one? Is this different? How long does it last? And uh, how do we 
encourage the institutions around us to keep moving forward with their strategy, which is yeah. what you just talked about. So, so looking at crypto only, it reminds me a lot of the year 2000. Yeah. And I was a lawyer in private practice then representing a lot of dot coms, many of which crashed and burned. Right. And the big joke then was pets.com. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, the joke was, well, who wants to buy dog food online? 20 years, a lot of people are buying dog food online, right? What got crashed and burned were the weaker protocols, the weaker business model, the unsustainable business models. Yep. And what emerged out of that was Amazon, Facebook, YouTube, right? So I, I'm fully convinced that from a crypto-only point of view, mm -hmm. uh, this will wipe out the, the, the flawed business models, the flawed protocols, and what will rise out of it will be the better ones. The future of finance is digital, it's networked, and that's not gonna change. However, unlike 2000, I think what's taking place right now is much bigger and much deeper. And crypto is just first, the first asset class to get whacked by what I think, sadly, is gonna be a prolonged period of economic uh, struggle. I, I think, you know, I think uh, we're, we're looking at persistent uh, inflation, not, not transitory by any means. I think our policymakers, both in uh, the Fed, uh, in this administration, the prior administration, are way behind the curve. There's a series of policy mistakes that got us here uh -huh. and a, a series of continuing policy mistakes. And until those policy mistakes and the people responsible for those policy mis mistakes are moved on to their next retirement or wherever else they're going and we get new leadership in that can undo some of these policy mistakes, I think we're looking at a long period, a prolonged period of inflation, of, of and the only response to that is going to be to stall economic growth. So stagflation. We've got a, you know pretty good job market right now. I don't think it's going to last because once you stall growth, you're going to stall job creation. And again, I don't think the leadership in charge right now has shown that they've got the ability. This is not, you know, we don't have a Paul Volcker of bills. And I say that with great respect to my friend sure. uh, Jay Powell, but. Um, that we're in for we're in for some a world of hurt, and it's you know crypto is just the first to get whacked by it. I think it's going to be more broad. So you don't think the seventy five bit right raise yesterday fixed it? I thought that was the magic one from the Fed, no? Yeah. Um, I, look, I'm not going to comment on specific moves, but um, I, I do think we're going to need some new thinking. Uh, we're we're going to see real hardship around the world. The the uh, the UN is saying we're looking at hundreds of million people in, in maybe in starvation. Um, uh, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon has said a hurricane is coming. I think it's a force, force five uh, tsunami. I think it's going to uh, do do a lot of destruction. But you know, you know, creative destruction, right? We need to destroy destroy a lot of flawed models, a lot of flawed thinking, a lot of flawed policy responses. Um, and uh, once we get through that, I have no doubt the future of finance will be digital, will be networked. You know, technology is is like. It's like a roaring wind. You know, you can't stop it. You can't hide from it. It's going to come uh -huh. despite our policy mistakes. And, you know, and the policy mistakes are at the regulatory level as well. Um, it's the job of regulators not to thwart market development, but to enhance market development. Let society work out the value of assets, of products. Of course, you've got to surround that with good, solid uh, consumer protection, investor protection, all of the things that regulators are there to do, all the things we did at the CFTC. And yet, we we'll enable the market to succeed, not to not to throttle it. I think that's a great point. There's some there's some scary uh, messages there from from Christopher, but we don't stop. We're going to have to, you know. I call our business actually just a business for all seasons. You can't if you've only business model only works in a bull market, then you haven't got a business. If it only works in a bear market, you haven't got a business. If it only works when there's volatility, then you haven't got a business. But I think the good thing about capital markets in general and crypto is that hopefully the, those of us around the institutional space just keep building out the ecosystem. Yeah. And yeah, we're all gonna have to take some pain. I mean, it's very simple, you know, you're not getting paid 10% more in your business right now, and yet uh, you've got to pay 10% more in wages. That has to break at some stage. We're aware, everyone's aware of that. But, you know, what I would say, there's a lot of press inches out there about cutbacks in crypto. Like, it is dot .com, it is 20 years back. They got too big too early. Um, the infrastructure wasn't there. Wasn't there. That's exactly what you're talking about. You know, we, we were trying to buy pet food using dial-up modems, right? Yeah. Um, the, the infrastructure wasn't there. The ideas were right. 
Yeah. And, and the same thing is happening here. The ideas are right. We're way too far ahead of ourselves. The infrastructure is not there. We'll keep building out the infrastructure. We'll weather the storms that are coming. We'll get to the, the other side. A lot of the policy mistakes and the people responsible for them will, will wash out. We'll get to the other side. Younger thinking will come into play. A, a generation that's grown up on a network will come into government, regulatory bodies, policymakers across the globe. They'll have a greater affinity to this. They'll, they'll think less defensively about the status quo and more offensively of how do we use this technology to advance. And the other thing, the last point about this is we have ignored the issue of financial under-inclusion. In a world of, of eight and a half billion people, we're tolerating a billion and a half being excluded from the current mm -hmm. system because they don't have credentialed identity. The beauty of a network-based financial system is we can let a lot more people into the system. And that's got to be a global imperative. I agree. And I think, I, think they want, I think they want us to leave, so we're going to leave it there. Um, thank you, Christopher. It's been a enjoyable fun. chat.